Welcome to Almost 30. Welcome to our show. Welcome to the show that you are tuning into. It's Lindsay and Krista. Thanks for being here. Thank you for choosing Almost 30. There's a lot out there, but we're grateful. We're grateful you're Super here, grateful. especially the OGs who have been with us through it all, through the whole evolution of the show. You don't need to be 30 to listen or almost 30. We accept anyone and everyone, and we are all about supporting you in your evolution, making you feel less alone, and providing you with inspiring conversations, interesting insights, and just a little laughter. Mm -hmm. Coming out of, I live in New York, coming out of winter and being out a little bit more often, I've seen almost 30 Nation out in the wild really? a lot more, and I forgot how amazing it is to just like connect with people in that way in person and I love our listeners because they're always like hi the best <laughs> it's the best and I saw someone at a, a workout class the other day and it was just so it's so nice they're so cool it's the best so if you ever see us say hi we speaking, probably look like shit but speaking whatever of the class were you at the class <laughs> yes so I was at the class one time like a year two years ago when it was open or I don't even know when and this girl approached me and you know the class just rocks you so the class is like a cathartic um, dance type of workout by Taryn Toomey. So we did an interview with Taryn that's really powerful. And it's all about vibration, frequency, just kind of being in your body. I know I'm saying all the buzzwords, but it's hard to explain. It's yes. really just meant to be felt. The best. And we were in this class and this girl was like, came up to me and we just started, we were crying to each other because we were like so mm. ready to cry. Yeah. After the class, I was like, wow, that was fascinating. <laughs> no words, just No crying. words. No, she was saying some things uh, yeah, that I was yeah. crying and that she was crying and it was, yeah, it was a yeah. whole vibe. Yeah, no, it's it's literally the best. <laughs> the girl that I ran into, I, I was waiting in line to go to the bathroom. And she, at first she wasn't paying attention to like someone going. And so I was like, oh, are you, are you in line? <laughs> and she looked at me and she's like, I love your podcast. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, thank you. Aww. I was like, what's your name? What's happening? I was like, I don't have to pee anymore. Let's talk. Yes. Yes. You're like, you go. I just realized, so Lindsay's here in town in Los Angeles. Lindsay comes in, you know, every two months, every six weeks. I go to New York sometimes. Mm -hmm. And this is like my outfit for recording week. Yeah. I've been wearing Expect me not to be in anything else. We're actually wearing the same top. Yep, we are. wearing the same exact top. I've only been in this top, and I just realized that. I was like, "Oh, this is my recording outfit." I would much rather have just one, just a uniform. Same, dude. Steve I don't Jobs it, Mark Zuckerberg it. Who's the lady? Elizabeth Banks it. I uh, know. Elizabeth, you're gonna get you're gonna get that wrong. Who, what's her name over. from the Ther Theranos? Theranos. Theranos. Elizabeth. It's it's Elizabeth. Oh, Elizabeth Holmes. Holmes. So actually, in one of our interviews, we random ab about her. We talked with Vanessa Van Edwards about charisma and, mm. you know, all that kind of stuff. And she was talking about how Elizabeth trained to make her voice really deep. Yes. Because it commands more power. Mm -hmm. People perceive someone to be more powerful. And more, like the more masculine. The more masculine. How embarrassing. <laughs> Dude, how embarrassing. Dude. Her to be like, hello. But it was so obvious. It was exactly. She's like down here and she's like <laughs> trying to be. And you're like, you're she's like, what I love. Does about that this hurt? Thing. <laughs> exactly. It's like painful. And she also, I think she also said, Vanessa said, she doesn't blink. Yes. So but that's because she's a robot. A robot. <laughs> her and Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> I literally, I need y'all to They're watch videos of both of them. There's something very similar. Yeah about the gays yes they don't blink cut from the same cloth cut from the same like assembly line yeah <laughs> <laughs> sometimes people are robots it literally just happens yeah it's all good it's all good it's all good oh, baby. speaking of that we have our starseed quiz on the website oh yeah for so, all you non-robots for all you non-robots <laughs> to prove your alien nature so on the website there is a quiz you can take for free which is which type of starseed are you or which Basic star system star system you're mm -hmm. from what star system are you from it's so cool where how about you where are you're you pleiadian from? i'm pleiadian where i'm arcturian cool and in the in the results so far arcturians the rarest dominating well the do rarest we, oh the rarest yes oh i love that a lot of people are saying they're um dming me that they're syrian or andromedan oh interesting yeah actually i've got a lot of pleiadian interesting i haven't met i've only met one arcturian cool we do have Arct arcturians um protecting almost 30 yes mm -hmm. yeah and they're way, very present cool. on the planet lately 
Very cool. Anyway, so aliens. Anyway. <laughs> I'm excited about this one. We're so honored. Shalina got to come in person. She's mm-hmm. someone we're like DM friends. We were texting for a while after this. She's someone we both really admire. She's incredible. She's really just very truthful, very heart-centered, doing work that helps so many people. And what I didn't know about her is that um, – Sometimes online, you know, when you see someone that is sharing so much information and so much powerful information, you're like, how much lived experience or qualified are people? It's it's Instagram. You yeah. know, you don't you don't really know. And how qualified and how true is her experience to the work that she shares was so profound to me. Yeah. You know, she's yeah. gone through a lot of different trainings, a lot of different qualifications and certifications which isn't like everything, but I was really blown away with how integrated she is with the work that she shares. Yeah. So you might know her as Rising Woman on Instagram. She also has her personal Instagram as well at Shalina Ayana, but she's the founder of Rising Woman, a growing community of more than 3 million readers. Her training and immersion in couples facilitation, inherited family trauma, family systems, conscious relationships, somatic healing, and plant medicines inform her holistic approach to seeing relationship as a spiritual path. Y'all follow her right now. Yes. Her posts are just fire. Fire. Can you read that one that yeah. we pulled up before? I was reading this like a little. It's funny because like I read this and it's like, <laughs> it's basically like my dirt. <laughs> but it's, it's like, it, yeah, let me read this one. That's very personal to my life right but now. Think, no, but I think it's very, no. th- very powerful for people. Yes. Okay. It's, it's applicable to... All things. Yeah, truly. Work, friends, family, relationship. So she says, authentic love can be unconditional and still require reciprocity, respect, and mutual willingness. Without these things, what you're left with is activated wounds looking to get safety, security, and validation from a place it doesn't exist. The idea that unconditional love translates to, I love you no matter what you do to me, is harmful. You can have love for someone in your heart, yes, but to be in love with someone, there is a mutual connection and energetic agreement required. Being in love with someone means there are two people who are willing to show up for each other and accept one another as imperfect, though it is also though it also means prioritizing safety and honoring each other's boundaries. Mm-hmm. If boundaries are consistently being crossed, bids for connection are consistently being dismissed, or games are at the foundation of the relationship, what you're in is not love, it's wounding. Can these types of relationship dynamics heal? Yes. Can we heal them with the person we're currently dancing in dysfunction with? Sometimes. But we cannot do it alone. Both people need to be equally willing, accountable, and committed to the inner work and to the relationship. Mm -hmm. So what if it's clear the person isn't willing? Can you still do your healing work? Yes. And if you're currently involved in a dynamic that depletes you rather than nourishes you, requires you to self-abandon or chase unavailable love, then doing your work may look like gracefully walking away and putting your heart first. Romantic love is relational. There's no other way to put it. If the relational aspect is missing, you may be pouring your energy into the wrong places. You can connect to universal oneness and loving energies through nature, through a smile to a stranger, connecting with an animal, drawing, painting, singing, sweeping, making tea, eating food, planting flowers. Mm. There are so many ways to connect to love within and around you without endlessly pursuing someone who is expressing through their words or actions that they don't want to show up. No one will meet 100% of our needs all the time. A perfect partner doesn't exist, but a willing partner does, and we all deserve that. Ooh. Ooh, You guys, that was like a... That was a hefty slider. That was a... (laughs) That was a hefty... That was a a book. That was an actual book. (laughs) Like, that was a sermon dissertation book just in one post. I I really appreciate that she didn't stop at, like, two sliders. (laughs) because <laughs> I need I appreciate I could keep reading I know, I know. and each one was getting better and better and I love the solutions of the oneness mm-hmm. painting singing nature yeah and with animals and allowing like the the receiving and the giving of love to be also in those mm-hmm. relationships you know I think the romantic relationship obviously can just be the the number one yes. that we think of where we're like, we must get it from that and pour into it and receive from it. And not that that's not true, but it's like, are we also allowing for that other exchange elsewhere in the oneness of all things? Yes. And it's like, we realize that we're being depleted by not, yes, you know, engaging. Yes. And yeah, it's like letting nature nourish you, letting your pets nourish you, letting mm-hmm. God nourish you. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, how can you find that in places where it will 
always sustain and fulfill you. Yeah. And a partner, perfect partner doesn't exist. And I've in the sacredness of being single program, um, you know, we talk a lot about that because I think oftentimes we go into or want to go into relationship as the perfect partner, like finally perfect, fixed all my stuff. I healed all my wounds, but it just, it's not possible. Like you, there will be two imperfect human beings with more growth to do with more healing to do. And that's kind of the beauty in it. But the willingness part I think is so important. And just speaking like from your own willingness, it's like, I've had to just reckon with like, how much am I willing to just really show up, to just really be messy, to really own certain things, to really express how I feel. And in the beginning, it was like hard. I'm like, oh, I'm not willing actually yeah, right dude. now. <laughs> Story of my life. It's hard. Story of my dang freaking life. Her new book out now is Becoming the One. I'm She's pumped. pumped. She's such a powerful writer. Um, and so I'm really excited for her to put a lot of her beautiful work and insight and power into this book that you can get now. Yeah, I'm so excited. So thank you so much, Shalina, for coming in person. I oh know. my God, we so got to blessed. Be with her in person. It was like a freaking so freaking dang blessed. delight. Yeah, it truly, truly was. So right now, the challenge for the life edit is happening. So it is from April 12th to the 16th. This is the life edit mini challenge, and the life edit is really going to be something that is so powerful. It is done fully by me. It is the energy energetic and tactical tips you can integrate right now to begin embodying the highest version of yourself. So when I started to do the work on visualization and manifestation and all of these things, the subconscious reprogramming, I realized that I didn't feel like I had actionable steps that I could take within my every single day to bring me closer to that highest version of myself besides doing the actual work. So that meant how can I um, make my apartment feel more like it's aligned to the highest version of myself? How can I make my Instagram make feel like it's more aligned to the highest version of myself how can I make my clothes and my closet feel like it's aligned to the highest version of myself Mm -hmm. how can I make my fitness routine feel really good for me where I enjoy it and I don't dread it so that was the life edit the life edit program is going to be happening right after this mini challenge on the 17th enrollment will be open we will cap the um, enrollment for that so make sure you sign up now and if you want to get in the free mini challenge you can get five of the practices that I apply in the life edit to your email Mail every single day. It's going to be really, really powerful. So go to Life Edit by Krista. That's K R I S T A dot com or almost thirty dot com, and you can sign up for the free mini challenge happening now. Amazing! Thanks so much for listening to Almost Thirty. Make sure you're subscribed everywhere you listen to podcasts, and if you're called to write a review, it's a great way to support the show. It means that more people will see and hear Almost Thirty, and we're just so so appreciative of that. We're on TikTok, baby. Oh, man. We're on TikTok. Oh, man. Your moms are on TikTok, and we're sharing clips from the show, really helpful, actionable um, insights and information, just basically some of the best of the best from the podcast. So make sure to subscribe or do whatever you do on TikTok. Yeah, whatever you do. I don't know. You watch it? You You watch it? it, You you comment. Yeah, you (laughs) follow it? You follow. Yeah, I think they follow. You, cool. (laughs) do whatever do whatever you gotta do on tiktok just make us fucking viral yes almost 30 podcast on tiktok (laughs) almost 30 podcast on instagram we're changing up our instagram strategy so i'm excited to see what you guys think we'll be updating some of our branding and stuff we're just keeping it fresh over here can't wait all right y'all enjoy this one we'll see you on the other side We'll be back in just a moment but first we want to share a little bit about the sponsors who support this episode So I didn't know if you know, but as we age, we lose acromancia in our gut biome. So we have something in our gut biome called acromancia. It's a gut lining builder, and we actually lose this as we age. So there is a way for us to improve the levels that really improves your gut microbiome, and it's through Pendulum's Acromancia Supplement. Yeah, Pendulum is a great brand. Their team of scientists, doctors, and innovators are the first to isolate Acromancia, and it's pretty incredible, the first to do so. The Pendulum Acromancia also contains a prebiotic to help feed the Acromancia so it can thrive in your gut and get right to 
work. I really, really love this brand. They come recommended from a bunch of our friends in this space. So excited to introduce you to them. So take care of your long-term health. Get the probiotic rooted in the latest microbiome science from Pendulum. Visit PendulumLife.com and use code ALMOST30 for 20% off your first month of membership. That's PendulumLife.com, P-E-N-D-U-L-U-M-L-I-F-E.com. Use the promo code ALMOST30 for 20% off your first month of membership. I realized when we had this event, we should have you speak at Mark Grove spoke at it yeah. with other people that having, hearing myself speak back helps me process. Mm-hmm. It like helps me understand what I'm going to say next better. Right. It's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. We, I had my like AirPods in during one of the sessions and it's like, um, it almost feels like I have earplugs in, so I'm not <laughs> hearing any feedback, but uh, you know, it's like a yeah. weird experience where and especially over Zoom, it's a little, yeah, little interesting. It's it definitely takes takes practice, but also like staying in your body because mm-hmm. you could be so heady. Yeah, kind of like seeing other, pe- you know. Yeah, it's kind of disorienting. Yeah, completely. Yeah. I'm so happy you're yeah. here. So Shadina. happy. You know, it's so fun to, to meet people in person. You've been watching them online. It's like kind of weird. I know. You're like, I know. <laughs> you live inside of my little. <laughs> yeah, <box. I> <laughs> you're a projection. <laughs> <laughs> You're a figment of my imagination. It's true. It's really, really true. Um, you know, and Chris and I were talking before this and just how your words are just in- incredibly potent, mm-hmm. true medicine every day. Um, I feel like I, I pass along your post to so many people on the regular. And then there's this aspect of receiving your messages and then also being there's like a mystery Mm -hmm. of like the person behind them a little bit, Mm -hmm. right? Unless you really dive into your work and, and listen to you on, on other podcasts. But I would love for our audience just to ground us in your story for Mm -hmm. you to share what feels really relevant about your story. I know it's incredibly deep and, Mm -hmm. um, it's inspired all of your work. Mm -hmm. Um, but I would love for you to share. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, it's funny that you mentioned the mystery piece because I feel like that's actually an element of my work that yes. I'm navigating right now, especially, you know, coming more into my voice with my book and all of that. I'm like, okay, I'm stepping more into, you know, Shalina, Ayana, here I am. And, you know, for a long time, channeling those messages through Rising Woman really has been just something that I've done to connect with the collective. Mm-hmm. And, it's been a huge element of my journey to go through those really hard experiences, to go through the grief and the loss and pretty much every trauma you can imagine and then cultivate the medicine from it and and really share it. And I felt like that's been part of my life path. And it started really young, you know, like a lot of people know that, you know, when I was really little, I, I was born actually in an emergency situation, you know, my mom, Uh, was already in the hospital she had been attacked and um, my father whom I've never met was trying to kidnap me from the hospital so from the moment I was born we were snuck out of the hospital in the back door at 2 a.m. so from the moment I was born I was on the run right and so that really ingrained into me my relationship patterns Um, and for many years we were just kind of on the run bouncing around and by the time I was three I was in and out of foster homes and from that point on I endured a whole bunch of really hard experiences from sexual abuse to you know abandonment and neglect and just feeling really alone in the world feeling really like a like a survivor you know and when I was 12 I was considered what they call ward of the government. So that means that the government is my legal guardian now. My mother no longer has custody. And I actually had a police officer assigned to my file. And I was known as the AWOL kid. And that basically means like always on the run. Mm. So pretty much I was never in the foster home. I was always running away. Um, And that really was a huge part of my story. And truthfully, it's still in me that runner like that's my instinct when I'm scared or when I'm backed against a corner I want to run um, that comes up in my marriage still and you know thank goodness I have a partner who's so sturdy and, and present and willing um, but that 
really came to a halt in my mid-20s when I, I married the wrong person. Just, I don't even know why I married. There wasn't even really that much attraction there. It was very much just this karmic thing we needed to play out. Mm. And uh, all of it blew up in my face. I lost everything. Like I had a business at the time, lost all of my money. My cat, who was like my soulmate, just disappeared, got taken by coyotes. Um, my ex-partner, you know, he took off and just sort of, left everything in the house and didn't see him for like a year it was just such a deep moment of shatter for me like everything that I thought I knew was gone and I remember standing in the driveway while he was driving away and I just had this flooding memory of being three and the moment my mom dropped me off at that foster home and I remember screaming and just begging for her to come back and just watching her drive away and in that moment I was like oh this isn't about him. You've wanted this relationship to end forever. This is actually your childhood wounds really surfacing. And the truth is, is when I was in my mid twenties, I was kind of a nightmare in relationship. Like I couldn't be intimate. I couldn't really be fully committed. I couldn't be vulnerable. Like there was nothing that I was bringing to the table in relationship that was really that healthy or awake. So that was like, okay time to wake up and through that that's what brought me deeper into the work all the medicine journeys all of the therapies all of the breath work uh and then I started writing and here we are my thing woman was born wow yeah it was hard to it's sometimes I get so visual that I like start to my eyes start to water because you Mm. think about just a baby at a hospital and you think about a little girl sitting outside of a foster Karen, mm-hmm. it's just so incredibly painful. I want to talk about, before we get into the story a little bit more, I want to talk a little bit about something you just mentioned at the very beginning about being seen because it is interesting mm-hmm. that you have been so behind the scenes with yeah. it. And it's, I remember when we started to DM, I was like, who's the per?" I was like, who's the person? And yeah. I was like, and then I was like, wow. It just was fascinating. I'm like this, the energy of rising woman, and I think a lot like almost 30 is its own energy. Yeah. It's like its own energy that's channeled through you that almost is received by people that feels more universal sometimes than when we look at a human so can you talk a little bit about your process now to allow yourself to be seen Mm -hmm. yeah well it's it's been an interesting one because in some ways you know a a lot of times I've had the symbol as the profile photo and I, I recently shifted that with my book coming out and it felt really scary actually and it's not that I'm all that shy or that I don't want to be seen it's more this knowing that with being seen comes a lot of projections and a lot of stories or ideas about who I am. Um, And I am kind of just like a very awkward hermit. Like my husband always laughs because every time we go out, I get recognized. doesn't matter what country we're in, where we are, like somebody recognizes me. And I'm not really the type of person who's like, oh yeah, hey. And so, (laughs) you know, so (laughs) orchestrated with my responses, I get like kind of weird and like an awkward turtle and he just smiles and laughs and it's like she's really happy to meet you <laughs> <laughs> and he, he loves it because he finds it you know endearing mm-hmm. um and so I'm just like working on that piece uh but yeah it's just been it's been a little bit confronting for me because I want to share my work and I want to connect with people and I want my work to be spread far and wide and at the same time I don't want to be another person in a space creating an illusion You know, I just I want to be sort of a pillar of of honesty and of strength Mm -hmm. for people and to just sort of normalize that the relational journey is confusing and hard sometimes. And it's also beautiful and worth it. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's been a process for me, especially, you know, now my book is coming out. Mm -hmm. It's my name on the front of the book. And I was like, okay, I'm doing this. And it has felt just like a little nudge from spirit to step into it. Yeah. Yeah. Just for anyone that's listening and they might not exactly know what a projection is. Can you explain what a projection is? Yeah. We all do it. It's essentially, you know, we have our beliefs and our experiences and our memories that we have from our history. And then in our present day reality, you know, whatever we're seeing, we're often taking that past lens and we're just projecting it onto the present moment. So for example, in, you know, past relationships, you know, we've been hurt or we've been betrayed and then we come into a new relationship there's a lot of times where we will expect the exact same thing to happen or we won't trust a person's actions or words even though 
they're showing us that we can trust them because what we know is that you know love isn't safe and so we're bringing our past and we're projecting it into the future onto somebody else or we're making assumptions or judgments about who we think somebody is based on someone else we met that looks like them or that Mm -hmm. sounds like them or you know it's Mm -hmm. it's a story that we build how have you been able to dissolve your own personal projections onto things uh well a lot of inner child work Mm -hmm. and a lot of mother and father work that was a big one for me especially coming from my history like not having met my father but having him as this figure in my psyche and then having this really intense history with my mom and you know we have a good relationship now it's still it's a unique relationship given the circumstances but uh I don't think I realized until that experience, that catalyzing experience where everything kind of got stripped away, that I was projecting my mother onto every man that I met. And I was just taking out my rage and my hurt and my abandonment wound and all of it. Uh, And so, you know, I still project. We all, we're Mm -hmm. always going to project. You know, both my husband and I, we project on each other. And the key for us is just repair and catching it, you know, um, either in the moment or after. Uh, but it is just sort of one of those processes of going through your history and acknowledging where you were hurt, where you felt unseen, where you felt unloved. And instead of trying to sweep it under the rug, which it'll just come back, really acknowledging it and moving through it, feeling it. Mm-hmm. So it's it's a little bit of a journey backward and then all the way through mm-hmm. to the present. Mm-hmm. So you can just sort of be here. You know, mm-hmm. and, and really learn to trust love again, which for so many of us is so hard. Mm-hmm. Trusting love is hard. With the mother and the father wound, so it's interesting because I have more, I, this is my perception, I have more of a mother wound, and yeah. that was really a lot of the work that I started to do in like 2019, 2020. Mm-hmm. And I haven't even dug into father wound work, and I think that's ideas of that have sort of come up in therapy where I'm like, huh, that's an interesting thing because – now it's like I'm seeing more of the truth of yeah. how I grew up because I see my father in such a positive light. Mm-hmm. And now I'm like, oh, wow, like, you know, you kind of wake up to mm-hmm. the actual truth in like a non judgmental way. I'm like, oh, wow, this was an interesting dynamic that was playing out that I wasn't even really aware of and that I didn't even see as bad. But we have a lot of people in our community who are, are working on the mother wound or working on the father wound. What is the difference between the two? Like, how do you, are they healed differently based on the trauma or are they healed di- differently based on the energies they bring? Mm-hmm. You know, everything is energy and I think they are unique wounds and they're also very much the same. Like in my book, I just say the mother father wound is how I frame it because they're one in the same and they're unique right so how we relate to women is very much rooted in how we related to our mothers and how we relate to men is very much rooted in how we related to our fathers now the interesting thing for me and I just want to share this reflection with you because I can really relate is I never met my father he was abusive to my mother they were together for a very short time he stalked us for like seven years or something of my life even though I had never met him and yet I found all of the ways to blame my mother for everything. Mm -hmm. And so what I found when I was doing father work um, with my husband, actually, he would hold space as father and we would do these dyadic processes. And I would almost pedestal him. Mm -hmm. Mm. And actually, um, I think it's Maureen Murdoch in The Heroine's Journey. She talks about this. She talks about how in the way that our patriarchal society is structured, we sort of put all of the blame and all of the onus on mothers and we just glorify the father Mm -hmm. and so we just sort of ignore that aspect and I realized in those processes that that's kind of what I was doing I was just Mm -hmm. assuming that you know he must have loved me and he must have been really smart and he must have been amazing and so I really had to witness that and then claim back my capacity to also process anger with the father and then to really let him see my anger and my sadness, mm-hmm. um, which allowed me to you know, give that more to my husband as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think it's interesting because I talk to a lot of people who experience that, mm-hmm. you know, where they're like, oh, well, you know, everything was great with my mom, but not my dad or vice versa. Um, and what we have to remember is in a family system, there's always players. There's always a scapegoat. There's someone who's enabling. There's someone who's just pretending that they have nothing to do with it. But really, we're all playing a role. 
And so the healing, it's not in blame. We acknowledge the things that hurt so that we can process it, but we don't even have to talk to them about it. It's really in accepting, Mm -hmm. okay, this happened, this didn't feel good, this is how I didn't feel seen. And when we can process it and make peace with it and accept our reality, then we are able to step into new territory Mm -hmm. in relationship. And so for me, that's the healing. And I like to say that there's a difference between forgiveness and acceptance. And depending on your situation and your history, you might be working towards acceptance and not forgiveness. And that's okay. Yeah, I think that's an important differentiation because I feel like a lot of people think that they have to have a conversation with the person Mm -hmm. and sometimes that's not you know it could kind of dredge up and especially if the other person is either not open to it or kind of still in their process it can be it can be detrimental um I'm curious you mentioned working with your husband Mm -hmm. on your father wound yeah that sounds like an ideal scenario in terms <laughs> of partnership, conscious mm-hmm. partnership work. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure a lot of people listening, you know, who are in partnership would love to bring a bit more of that conscious work to their relationship. How, how did you bring that to both of you? Like mm-hmm. in a way that, um, felt mutually beneficial and also just really conscious rather than I feel like sometimes the masculine is like what you know why do we have to do this and not quite understanding the the effect Mm -hmm. that it could have how Mm -hmm. did you bring that in yeah I mean I I feel really blessed that my partner he was already you know he had a counseling degree he had been doing men's work and working with um Mm -hmm. with people for a long time and he had been doing some of his own work and I had been doing my own work and then when we met I was like, hey, I'm going to do this Tantra training. Do you want to do it with me? We're two months in. And he was like, well, what if we break up? Like, it's, we've only been seeing each other for a few months. And I was like, no, that's not going to happen. Let's just do this. And he was like, okay. And <laughs> so we just dove right in. So two months into our relationship, we essentially started therapy together. Our first fight, we actually went to therapy. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And uh, I'm just really lucky that he is so willing. And I talk about this a lot where, you know, in relationship, the most important thing is that both people are willing because that just makes it all easier. Um, And for us, it's a balance, right? Like when we create these scenarios and we're setting up a healing container, we both agree on what we're doing and we both agree on the timing and we hold a container that's structured. Mm. And it's not just me, you know, processing. We, We take turns. So like I would hold space as his mother, right and and he would hold space with my father and we would switch and so it was very much this we're equally showing up to process uh which helped us a lot because we learned so much about each other through that we also did you know a lot of work we did Harville Hendrix you know getting Mm -hmm. love you want workshop and all of those things as well um and now we have a couples course where we actually teach couples like we take them through the sessions that we've done Mm -hmm. to sort of help guide them through it uh but one of the most important things that I could say for addressing the masculine piece where, you know, is there somebody who maybe isn't willing or doesn't want to do it? You obviously can't force anyone, right? We all have to choose. Um, but what I've found is that men's groups are really important. And my husband's an executive of uh, men's groups called Arca Brotherhood uh, in, in space in Canada. And they have, I don't know, 600 members or something yeah. like that. Um, there's a few in the U.S. as well. And what I've found is that it's really important for men to gather in small groups together and devote themselves to the inner work where they can process, you know, what was their relationship with their mom? What was their relationship with their dad with each other and really practice being vulnerable and being seen together and also having a space where they're encouraged to go deeper in their partnerships. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of this twofold. I don't think that we're meant to do it all together in, you know, romantic context, Um, So there's got to be some balance, you know, having community to support us through it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's like the goal. And I think for a lot of people that are listening or a lot of women, it's like they're like, okay, so how do I get, you know what I mean? How do I get there? Like, what are some steps I can take to bring more conscious awareness to my relationship, to bring more of that? like healing opportunity Mm -hmm. that is happening, happening consciously. What would you say as some first steps for someone that wants to do that? One of the things is always recognizing when you're waiting for the other person to go first. 
because that's sort of a game that we play especially when it comes to dating and relationship and marriage it's like okay well uh, you go first I'll be vulnerable when you be vulnerable. I'll do the work when you do the work, you know. I'll open my heart to you when you open your heart to me. And it's very much this, it's a game that we play to protect ourselves. And it doesn't get us anywhere. And so there's this mantra of just going first, you know, taking the leap. And if you really are in a relationship where it's not safe to do that, then that's not a relationship for you. But if you're in a relationship where you know, you love this person, you want to devote yourself to this person, they're not going to be perfect, then just go first whenever you can. And if you're both doing that, that's mm-hmm. a really beautiful gift, you know, uh, because if we're able to look past our fear and our walls and our guards and all of the stories that we have, and in those moments where we want to contract, see the best in our partner or assume the best instead of the worst, or just watch our minds. And that's a big one that I talk about a lot is watching the thoughts and the stories that you're creating in the moment. And if you can take just a few seconds to step away from that story that you're creating, then you can bring less reactivity and more presence, more consciousness. Because what we do often in relationship is we really just kind of bounce off of each other and we escalate really quickly like if you say something that I don't like then like I'm gonna just respond from that place and there has to be this equal commitment to not reacting even if one of us is a bit of a jerk you know one person has to decide like I'm not gonna I'm not gonna Mm. reflect that energy I'm just gonna hold space and holding space is not just for the masculine it's for all of us I really believe that so I think that's one of the biggest ways to start is are you aware of what your past wounds are and what triggers you and what your stories are? Can you breathe through those big feelings instead of pushing them onto someone else? We hope you're enjoying this conversation. We're going to take a few moments to share brands with you that we love and who support this show. Big news for us over here. We invested in a company. We are so excited about it. And it is House of Wise. We invested in House of Wise for so many reasons, but one of them was because of how incredible their products are. It was the first CBD brand that actually worked for me. I had taken tons of CBD before from tons of other brands and I actually didn't get it. And then I started using House of Wise and it has changed my life. My favorite product from House of Wise is their stress line. I love their stress gum. I love the stress drops. And when I'm feeling frisky, I will also get into their sex line by using their sex gummies about 30 minutes before we get down with it or the sex drops to get in the mood. I'm really loving the sleep gummies lately. So I will take a gummy about 30 minutes before I go to bed. And this has uh, just a little bit of melatonin, but the CBD as well. And this is a hemp derived full spectrum CBD. It works so well. I find myself in a really deep sleep. I wake up feeling good as well. Sometimes with anything you take for sleep, I feel a little funky, but these make me feel uh, amazing. So try House of Wise today. We're so excited for you. Amanda, the founder, has been on the podcast, so make sure you listen to that one. And all of your purchases help support the last Prisoner Project. So wise women of House of Wise have teamed up with the Last Prisoner Project. So you are giving back with your purchase. Go to houseofwise.co, use the code almost 30 and you'll get 20% off. I would stock up y'all. Houseofwise.co, use the code almost 30 for 20% off. I love Saqqara's Metabolism Super Powder. It is incredible. It's like this really rich dark chocolate and coconut essence drink that I will put in almond milk or cashew milk. And it really helps to support my metabolism. It helps me curb sugar cravings. It supports good gut health, helps my bloating and supports digestion. It is incredible. I love it so much. And it's really supported by the power of plants. So it helps support your metabolism through something called kelp extract, which is dry 
drawn from brown seaweed. This has tons of research in it. And I've noticed a really big difference in supporting my sugar cravings mostly. So I couldn't recommend this enough. And if you're looking for a new organic meal delivery service, highly recommend. I always feel so good when I'm on my Saqqara game. Just giving you a sneak peek of next week's menu. For example, sesame citrus glow salad. It has this beautiful carrot ginger vinaigrette, the red beet burger. It's served on their signature chia oat bread with avocado. They have a banana protein bread for breakfast. Y'all, you must, you must, you must, because it feels like you have a private chef when Saqqara is at your door. So, if you want to try Saqqara, their nutritionally designed chef-crafted breakfasts, lunches, and dinners, their pantry items, they got you. You are going to feel amazing. Better digestion, clearer skin. I promise you, your energy will be at 100. Right now, Saqqara is offering our listeners 20% off their first order when they go to saqqara.com slash almost Saqqara or enter the code almost Saqqara at checkout. That's A-L-M-O-S-T-S-A-K-A-R-A for the code. One more time, saqqara.com slash almost Saqqara to get 20% off your first order or use the code almost Saqqara at checkout. It's an interesting thing to think about the choice to not react. It's like that that anchor mm-hmm. in the moment so that the other can kind of regulate and come back to their body is mm-hmm. kind of how I, I'm feeling it. But um, yeah, I'm in my experience, it's been helpful because I am so in my head sometimes and mm-hmm. I'm so... I'm thinking of what the other person could be thinking about me. It's been helpful to kind of turn my brain inside out and I'm sharing with my partner which I feel safe to share with him is like this is what I'm thinking right now this is what I'm I'm thinking you're thinking and just kind of bringing him into like my inner world yeah um how do you how do you coach people individuals in kind of sharing that inner world because it doesn't always feel safe Mm -hmm. and so is there a relationship both to the thoughts, to the heart, to the body that you coach people through so that it can be um, really productive and healing to share. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, it's always important that we have the right people with us, right? Like, we don't want to... I know that there's this, like, idea that we should just be vulnerable with everybody, but I actually don't really believe that. I think our vulnerability is very sacred Mm -hmm. and not everybody deserves a seat at the table and that doesn't mean that we can't love them but from a distance right and so when we choose to share our vulnerability i think it's important that we choose to share with people who really have the capacity to hear us and to witness us and not want to fix which of course you know it's always going to happen sometimes but that should be the general Mm -hmm. theme uh for me one of the most important processes that I've guided myself through and actually created a meditation for this is the healing your inner child meditation. And it's a somatic self-soothing process that I guided myself through when Ben and I were in our power struggle phase, when we were in our reactive phase, when we weren't our highest self, when we were kind of in an unhealthy pattern in conflict, you know, very early on, like maybe a year and a half into our relationship. And so I guided myself through this process where I would lay down and have a hand on my heart and a hand on my belly, and I would visualize myself going back almost into the womb. Everything would be very dark, and I would meet that inner child that was totally alone and scared and didn't know how to be with all of her big feelings because nobody ever taught her. And so as a result, I was grasping at my partner to show up more or to you know engage in the conflict now and to fix things and you know he's being avoidant he's the problem when I realized like that was just my inner child not knowing how to deal (laughs) then I was able to self-soothe and then I was able to be with that intensity in my own body and through that I became less reactive more empowered more secure Mm -hmm. and then he began to come towards me more and we learned how to work through our stuff now we don't really have conflict that lasts more than a few minutes like it just doesn't happen like we get on each other's nerves or we'll snap at each other but it's over very very quickly because both of us have really become secure in ourselves and there is this non-reactivity within so i think all of us learning how to self-soothe gets us there Mm -hmm. 
And then when we learn how to self-soothe, we can actually be there for each other more because when we are grasping externally, it's really hard for us to actually let love in. Like we think we want someone to be there for us, but if they tried to come close, it's kind of like an electric fence. We'd zap them, Mm -hmm. right? So we're like, you don't show up for me. Like I want you to love me. You know, you don't listen or you're not here right now. But then if they were to actually try, chances are Mm -hmm. we would push them away. So when we learn how to self-soothe and be in ourselves, then we can come in more healthy and be like, okay, here's actually what I'm feeling. Here's my fear and here's what I need. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You, you mentioned something about the power struggle phase. Yeah. What's that? The power struggle phase I've is, never heard of that. Okay, so a lot of, a lot of uh, therapists from history have sort of coined this term. I think Carvel Hendricks talks about it okay. a lot in his book as well. And it's the stage after the honeymoon phase, which is, you know, in the honeymoon phase, you're sort of living in a fantasy mm-hmm. of who you think this person is, and they're the one. And, and then we get to the power struggle phase, where we really begin to see each other's mess a bit. You know, and maybe we start triggering each other a little bit. We don't always get our needs met. And in that, we're also seeing mm. our own wounds activate. Because generally speaking, if you're with a partner who's a good match for you, your wounds are going to perfectly match each other's wounds, which is so funny and annoying because you're like, what? <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. But that's it's really true. how it is. So when I when I see a couple whose wounds are perfectly triggering each other i'm like this is so beautiful like you are such a good match this is going to be so beautiful for you to do the work together you know because you are going to be able to heal um through that so the power struggle phase is that you know we are reacting we're defending we don't want to be seen anymore because our wounds are being activated Mm. and so that's really the phase where a lot of couples get very familiar and they just have a lot of conflict and they don't really have the tools to navigate it. Um, so a lot of relationships, they just stay in the power struggle phase until the relationship dies. And there's a lot of demonization of each other, right? Mm-hmm. We see this a lot in breakups too, where it's like, it's all the other person's fault and it's all them. And I just need to go out and find somebody new and then everything will be better. You know, I just need to find the one. I need to find that one person who is meant for me, who isn't going to make me feel that way. Mm -hmm. Um, But when in reality, we're going to hit the power struggle phase in every single relationship. And if we're together for 20 years, we're going to go through the stages of relationship over and over and over. And we're learning how to navigate those phases with more grace. So we could have a power struggle phase that's actually quite gentle if we learn how to be less reactive and more responsible for our own internal world. Mm-hmm. wonder why they call it power struggle. Because mm-hmm. it's like, what's the power? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? If they're wounds, yeah. like is it, like where does the power word come in? Well, you know, in every relationship, what are we usually fighting for in conflict? We're fighting to be right. Mm-hmm. Right, that's mm-hmm. true. And so, when we want to be right, that's power. Yeah, yeah. And also, our 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 little wounded egos and our you know that that protective mm-hmm. part of ourselves that doesn't want to be hurt again or doesn't want to be found out or doesn't want to look stupid. Yes, you know. So it is. It's a fight for power because we want to mm-hmm. feel right mm-hmm. and good and you know worthy, but we're approaching it in the wrong way. Mm-hmm. And so that's where when we see this battle in relationship where it's about who said what it's about blame it's about you know we're defending all of that that's a battle for power because someone's got to win and someone's got to lose versus entering into conscious conflict where we're both right we're both valid we have different realities Mm -hmm. and we want to get curious about each other and and somehow meet in the middle or come to a a reality that feels safe for both of us Mm -hmm. So that's the difference, right? Is we're kind of stepping out of that fight for to be right and more about understanding. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's wild the patterns in intimate relationship and how collectively <laughs> we're kind of seeing that, like that mm-hmm. kind of the avoidance of the trigger. Yeah. You know, where yeah. it's like, nope, I don't want to be triggered or that person triggers me and therefore we cannot be mm-hmm. or I can't watch this or yeah. engage with this. And it's just really interesting how that's, being reflective um on a large there's large so scale. many triggers it's so hard though too because there's so many like sure. if you think about how much access we have to triggering things mm-hmm. you know every article every you know social media it's like so it's so hard because we don't want to be avoidant of triggers you know but then also it's like dang there's a lot 
Mm -hmm. you know definitely and also this on the other side of like not wanting to trigger people yeah. it's yes. like that energy of like oh i don't Self want abandon that yeah but then yeah then you abandon mm -hmm. yourself or you're trying to manage the other person's reaction more so than how yeah yes. how you're feeling yeah. have you have you i guess you know in the times that we're living in have you like had moments of frustration mm -hmm. with that yeah. how have you navigated mm -hmm. I mean, it's a day by day thing. It's it's tough. I think social media is really hard for a lot of people. For me, it's really hard to exist on social media. Like I have millions of people reading my work. And of course, that means there's going to be millions yeah. of interpretations. And sometimes I write something that feels really honoring to me and people get really reactive. And I'm like, oh, wow, people are not hearing the transmission that I intended. And so just really accepting that that's the reality of social media. And also knowing too that there is a way to deliver in a gentle way. I think there's this dance right now between speaking our truth and also knowing that not every truth needs to be spoken yeah. publicly. Mm -hmm. Like that's to me not empowerment. I don't need to tell the whole world everything that I think or every opinion that I have. Um, and I think all of us need to be mindful of how much media we're taking in. We don't want to be triggered all of the time. We don't want to be in this constantly hyper aroused state in our nervous systems. I think what's important is that we're able to stay in our bodies mm -hmm. when we do feel activated and have the tools to navigate it mm -hmm. instead of blaming, because that's what we do. We just blame people. Well, you're not allowed to say this or you're not allowed to be that because it makes me feel this way instead of really owning that this is my internal experience and I'm responsible for my own internal reactions. And I'm not talking about like abusive dynamics mm -hmm. or anything like that. I'm just talking about, you know, day-to-day -day life. Like right. how we all perceive the world is so unique and different based on our histories. And what triggers me could be absolutely nothing to you. Could not even make a blip, right? And so we have to recognize too that, you know, we're all having different experiences and kindness can go a long way. Mm -hmm. Just curiosity. Mm -hmm instead of blame and you know i i believe that if what we're saying is coming from love then ultimately it's going to land you know for the most part mm -hmm. <laughs> if it's coming from love but a lot of times what we see is there's things that are curated right now especially in the media and on social media where it's actually coming from anger or from fear mm -hmm. but it's packaged in a little pretty bow um, but the energy transmits what we say and what we're transmitting can often be different. And I think as a collective, we can feel that. Yeah. You said Definitely. that you write, so you have a team, but she yeah. write you write and post, she does all of her posts mm -hmm. because of the en energy behind it. And I think that's so true. And I've noticed that whenever I have something that's like just drops in truly resonant, I'm like, Oh, this is really, it always feels the best and is received the best. I'm curious what you think about this because so a lot of people sometimes confuse love with control mm -hmm. or love with smothering or enmeshment or all these like these ideas about what love is and I think that's what's happening in the public too where people are sort of misinterpreting something to be love that might not be mm -hmm. might be fear might be something else this happens in the media you know the media is said to want to take care of us want to have our best interest at hearts or this is said to have anything else so how do people tell the difference between something that like actually isn't love but it is like trauma bonding mm -hmm. well love does not feel chaotic like love isn't a roller coaster and for a lot of us myself included we are conditioned to think that it is that there's these really high highs and these really, really low lows. And so then when we get into a healthy dynamic, it's boring, we're not turned on, we're like, this person's not for me. Uh, and so we really have to sort of look at what is our conditioning in order to know, you know, what's healthy or what's not for us. We have to examine our own conditioning. Like, what did I learn about love from my environment? What was my family programming like? What did I watch, you know, in my parents? How were their relationships? What, how did they speak about love and about sex and about communication and about each other? You know, what were their views on the world? Did they trust people or did they not trust people, right? Like, we have to ask ourselves those questions first. And then we can say, oh, okay, where am I carrying those programs into my present-day reality? 
And is that calling in the kind of relationship that I actually say I want? Because a lot of us, there's a, there's a disconnect between what we say we want and how we're showing up. But in a healthy connection, harmony and peace can be really rewarding and there can be still passion and deep love Um, but it doesn't feel unsafe doesn't feel painful it's not like you're going up and down on some sort of Mm -hmm. substance Mm -hmm. you know and and that's where even when we're talking about the power struggle we can get kind of hooked into getting into conflict because we're just wanting to feel something Mm -hmm. and so then we have to realize oh maybe I'm a little bit hooked on these ups and downs Like I'm looking for chaos, I'm looking for turmoil because that's what I know. And so I'm creating it in my romantic relationships or I'm creating it somewhere in my life instead of really being wired for harmony, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, So I think that's really what we have to look at. We'll be back in just a moment. But first, we want to share a little bit about the sponsors who support this episode. So today before my workout, I wanted to give myself a natural boost of energy and I'm not doing caffeine. I'm not doing any energy drinks. So what I did was took my athletic greens supplement. I love athletic greens. I always bring it when I travel. I always have it with me on the go. And it gave me this natural boost of beautiful energy for my workout. And I love it because it's just one scoop. So it's either one packet or one scoop. And it's so easy. This basically fills nutritional gaps. This is the category leading superfood product and brings comprehensive and convenient daily nutrition to everybody Um, and they are obsessed with quality. They are sourcing 75 vitamins, minerals, and whole food sourced ingredients, including a multivitamin, multimineral, probiotic, green superfood blend, and more in that one serving. They are high quality, bioavailable ingredients, and they work together again to fill those nutritional gaps. So support your energy and focus, gut health, digestion, immune support, and more. Athletic Greens is going to give you an immune supporting free one year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. If you visit athleticgreens.com slash almost 30 today, again, that is a full year free full year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. If you visit athleticgreens.com slash almost 30. So I was on the phone with my website designer and she said, have you ever heard of Issue? And I said, well, yes, I have. And she showed me some of the amazing blogs that she designed and how they incorporated Issue into their website. So they actually created these beautiful PDFs like for outfits for Cabo or products I love or holistic healing techniques and then embedded the code for these beautiful PDF and SEO friendly flip books into their website. So if you are a creator, you are someone that has a website or has something to say online, I highly suggest Issue. I was so impressed seeing these beautiful SEO-friendly embeddable flipbooks on these websites. This is an incredible platform. So basically you are going to create something once and then they will help to distribute it in a lot of different ways, whether it's brochures, flipbooks, magazines, what have you. If you're still attaching PDFs to emails or attaching PDFs to websites, no more. Issue will make your content look better. It will make it SEO friendly. It's incredible. And also you can seamlessly integrate tools you already use like Canva, Dropbox, and InDesign. I'm really excited for you if you're a creator, marketer, designer, anyone really who wants to make content, which is so many of you out there I know, I highly, highly recommend Issue. And you can start using Issue for free. They offer premium features that give a more customized experience. That's what we use and it's great. Get started with Issue today for free or if you sign up for a premium account, you will get 50% off when you go to issue.com slash podcast. That's I-S-S-U-U dot com slash podcast and use the promo code almost 30. That's I-S-S-U-U dot com slash podcast and use the promo code almost 30 at checkout for your free account or 50% off your premium account. That's issue.com slash podcast with promo code almost 30. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned before the, the idea or the concept of the one. Yeah. And, you know, I think it's linked to that fixation on this is how I think I should feel in relationship. Mm -hmm. Can you break down that? And do you believe that there is one person for everyone? And 
Um, yeah, I mean, that's why I called my book what I called it, right? I called it Becoming mm-hmm. the One because the idea that there is the one out there, outside of us, that's coming to save us and rescue us or complete us in some way um, is a bit of a myth. You know, it's not, it's not real. You are the one. I am the one. Like, we are the only ones that are going to be in relationship with ourselves for the rest of our lives. And our relationship to ourselves is the foundation from which all other relationships flourish, right? And so I believe that we have so many soulmates. Like, I think we can have soulmates that check us out at the grocery store. Like, there have been people in in my soul cluster, my soul family, who, you know, I've never really had a conversation with, uh, but I've seen them in different cities throughout my life. You know, I recognize them. You know, I'm like, oh, there's that person again who, like, you know, used to check me out at a grocery store when I lived in this city 10 years ago. Now, look at there at this festival. Here I am six years later. And oh, wow, now they've moved to this little island that I'm on. And this has actually happened. And I'm in those moments, I'm recognizing like this person's probably a soulmate. This person's probably traveling with me. And, you know, maybe we'll reconnect. Maybe we won't. Um, but I think when we can step away from that idea that there's one person out there for us, we can also get out of those patterns of chasing unavailable love or pursuing, you know, unhealthy relationships or, you know, dumpster diving for love, as I call it, when we're settling for scraps Mm -hmm. because we, we've, you know, made them our twin flame or they're our one and only. Mm -hmm. No, like there's so many people on this planet that we can connect with and have deep relationships with. And when we pedestal somebody and we make them, you know, the answer to all of our problems, we're really self-abandoning. And I think it doesn't have to be so, like, fantastical. It doesn't have to be so fantastical to be right. Like, it could be a more gentle story, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I used to be addicted to that. The yeah. chaos. <laughs> Me the too. chaos mm-hmm. of it all. I used to, in my normal life and then in my relationship, for sure. And I think there, we were told in the media that that type of relationship was love, that like the craze, sure. the passion, the desire. But you said before that there's three like entities in a conscious relationship, mm-hmm. spirit, you, and then the other person. I'd love to explore that a little bit. Mm-hmm. And for someone that maybe doesn't have a uh, spirit involved in their relationship mm-hmm. consciously right now, how would they do that? Mm-hmm. How would they bring spirit in? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's something that's going to be uniquely personal to every person. Um, For me, I see it as, you know, we have ourselves, we have the other, we have spirit, we have nature, right? There's this cyclical relationship. We're in relationship with ourselves, with the other, and with the world around us. And I think it all links up, you know, it's all together in, in one little circle. And when we are connected to spirit, for me, that looks like being very connected to the elements, really seeing how the elements play a role in my life, being connected to the seasons within my own body, within my own heart, and within within the earth, right? Um, Bringing in ritual and knowing too that when we're having these intense moments, when we're going through a moment of grief or we're going through a moment of loss, we're more open. We're more open to that connection to spirit. And we all have a connection to spirit. There's nobody on the planet who doesn't. And it's just whether or not we choose to experience it or not, or we choose to let it in, right? And I I see it as separate from religion. It's really the connection to source energy. It's Mm -hmm. that connection to nature and feeling that we are held by so much more than we know and really giving our relationship over and giving it over to love. So it's really this idea that, yes, you have two people or however many people you have in your relationship but then you're giving that relationship to something else to love and to truth and you're saying like my path and my devotion is to love and so you each walk that every day together and it makes those hard moments easier you know because you have a common goal that you're working towards which is giving yourselves over to love Mm. and so in each moment you can choose you know, are you choosing love? Or are you choosing fear? Are you choosing to blame? Or are you choosing to just be with for a moment? And and that's important. And when we take time alone, when we go out on our own, you know, if we're doing an inner child meditation or we're walking through the forest or we're swimming in the ocean or, you know, connecting with our pet, you know, I think those are moments of connecting to spirit mm-hmm. as well. Really letting that love in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's been 
it's felt like it's taken the pressure off of like the two humans to make it work you know Mm -hmm. to to like figure everything out and it's been nice to kind of have that third and now four I love that bringing in nature um to kind of like look to in those moments where you're like I don't know (laughs) like we need a moment and just kind of lean on spirit a bit more mm-hmm. um it's almost like the masculine and the feminine like the father as spirit and mm-hmm. the, the feminine as mother earth mm-hmm. energies too is almost like really nurturing and then like organizational almost for the relationship mm-hmm. i love that mm-hmm. you mentioned the cycles mm-hmm. and i'm curious about you know how you your relationship with your own cycle of your body mm-hmm. and um I listened a little bit to your journey and read a little bit about your journey with birth control, Mm -hmm. hormonal, um, and just kind of coming back to the body in Mm -hmm. that way. A Mm -hmm. lot of women listening have been on birth control Mm -hmm. and for various reasons. Mm -hmm. So I would love to, I would love to unpack that a little bit because I think it's so, so powerful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So it's been an interesting one for me because I was on birth control for about two months when I was like 15. Um, and in that period of time, I felt like I was actually going crazy. Mm-hmm. It stripped the lining of my uterus. I ended up in the hospital and I was on birth control when I was 15 because of, uh, oh, like painful cramps mm. and the doctor gave me all of these birth control pills. So basically from a teenager on, like I could never take birth control. So I've always been on this journey of learning how to work with my body and its natural cycles and learn how to work with herbs and when I was in my early 20s I became a doula and I started to attend births um, because I wanted to connect deeper to our cycles and to you know the sacred power that we all hold to bring life into this world Um, and so yeah for me it used to be this very elaborate ceremonial thing where every moon cycle I would put on red sheets on my bed and I had a red outfit and it was like very elaborate you know and I I, truthfully I don't do any of that anymore Mm -hmm. I just sort of I'm just with myself now was that in just celebration of of your bleed yeah it was you would just let your bleed happen Uh, yeah and just really just really honoring it you know um and in that time I had also gone through I've gone through many different trainings I've worked with many midwives and and different doula trainings to learn um how to use herbs for fertility or for conception or for pregnancy release um and so I've worked with women in in those realms as well and still do from time to time but it's very just behind the scenes um and for me it's always just been so important for people to know the reality of when you're putting birth control in your body, when you're putting in these synthetic pills and hormones, like you're not having a real period. And we're actually sort of cutting ourselves off from those cycles. And we're making ourselves like more flatline. Like if you look at the uh, female hormonal cycle, it's like very like up down wave patterns and then you look at the the male hormone cycle and it's kind of just like Mm -hmm. (laughs) and that's what women are doing to themselves when they're putting birth control in their bodies they're just kind of going flat and so I have a lot of women in my life who have come off birth control after you know eight to ten years and they're saying like wow I'm feeling all of this emotion and I don't know if I want this or I have to take time off of you know what I'm doing now and like I can't just work 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 all the time like I have these cycles that I have to slow down with and honor and our culture has kind of set us up to want that flat line Mm -hmm. and so reclaiming our cycles reclaiming our emotional being Mm -hmm. you know really being with that element of water Mm -hmm. in ourselves is so important and such a gift and uh yeah I I really I feel strongly that there are many ways for us to work with our with our bodies and fertility and I'm also a huge champion for everyone to just have a choice you mm-hmm. know, have a choice mm-hmm. for how that they how they want to do that mm-hmm. yeah definitely yeah the flatlining is what happened to me like I just felt like I discovered who I was when I got off of it yeah. I was on it from 14 to 26 yeah and I just didn't know who I was until I got off it mm-hmm. it's like wow and I didn't know how much it impacted my moods and just yeah. there was so much that no one really told me. And I think that's what I feel like is most important in the communication of everything, yeah. just to know what you're doing consciously, mm-hmm. you know, don't just take anything unconsciously. 
and understanding and knowing the body after has just been so beautiful and it is like the suppressing of the divine feminine because that divine Mm -hmm. feminine is cyclical you know the 24-hour cycle the month cycle like there's just so many so much power in the ebbs and flows of being feminine and of the rest and of the nourishment and I'm hopeful that and I feel like there's so many women that are reclaiming the beauty of their cycles yeah yeah Absolutely. And when I work with women who are in that process, it's really cool because they're, it's like coming online again after being dormant, Mm. you know, and there's like all of this experience that's happening for them that they haven't let themselves feel in Mm -hmm. so long. And they're like, I don't know if this is okay. Like, is this normal? Mm -hmm. But that in itself is a connection to spirit, right? Like as women, when we bleed, when we give birth, like we're, we're going into portals And we see, you know, like historically men would go through these rites of passage rituals or they do these like really, really intense things like fire keepers, drummers, those kinds of things in ceremony, because what they're doing is they're accessing that intense threshold that we go into cyclically through our cycles or through the birthing times. And, you know, I've had the privilege of sitting in indigenous ceremonies and witnessing this Mm -hmm. and actually witnessing, you know, a fire keeper or a drummer go into that trance space Mm -hmm. you know i've seen that same look in the drummer's eyes when a woman is leaving her body and going into the spirit realm to to bring her baby back right before she crowns and and the baby comes earthside there's this distinct look where you're like whoa you just left and i remember the first time i saw it and i was looking around the room at all the other i was looking at the midwife and everyone else and i was thinking did everybody see that like she just left her body um but nobody else saw it and I was like maybe I'm hallucinating and then I kept seeing and then I started researching and it turns out like there's a lot of you know indigenous wisdom keepers who say that a woman does leave for a moment she grabs goes and gets her baby from the spirit world and brings them back and I remember sitting in ceremony and witnessing this water drummer and he's drumming all night and they drum very very fast and it's insane how much work it is and it's around a fire all night long like no breaks and I watched that same Mm. look in the eyes like oh he just left and it was like this power and that's where I really got it you know like Mm -hmm. we're we are all accessing those states in a different way and the beautiful thing is is you know we have those states built in Mm. and we're trying to suppress them Mm -hmm. Um, but we shouldn't do that Mm -hmm. yeah Ooh, I know. <laughs> so good. I know. I'm so, like still so in good. the moment of the mom leaving the body. I know. <laughs> I'm like, because I just think about our current way in which we give birth. Mm-hmm. And I've been thinking about that a lot lately. And I just am like, huh. Like there's so much spiritual mysticism and power in the birthing process mm-hmm. yeah. that is sort of ignored yeah. or deduced. It's feared. Yes. Yeah, it's so feared. Yes. Yeah. It's so feared. Um, I want to talk about something you've been talking about lately, and I'm curious that you, if you've been healing it, because it seems like with your work, you're sort of sharing what you're like in process with or almost mm-hmm. or processed, mm-hmm. and you're kind of like moving on. Um, the inner team. Mm-hmm. And that's something mm-hmm. that we've been obsessed with lately. We've yeah. been talking a lot about that and really just recognizing and understanding that work. And I feel like that was another missing piece. So its first yeah. mother wound was a missing piece for me. Um, inner child later on and then this has been like so powerful Mm -hmm. and it's almost like I think we've talked about this before but the collective is going through an inner teen moment of that rage and that like mistrust of authority and that mistrust of the government and that mistrust of the media you know feeling like I thought the parents had it all under control and no one has it under control no one really knows what's going on what has been your journey with inner, inner teen work and that healing? Mm-hmm. It's been very much the sim- similar as, you know, the inner child work, really. Especially, you know, for me, I had basically been a street kid <laughs> in my teen years. And when I was, by the time I was 16, I was living on my own, working two jobs. And um, by the time I was 19, I was like, I'm going to stop, you know, drinking and doing drugs now because I've done the party phase, you know. So mm-hmm. I was like sort of doing it in a different timeline. Uh, but that inner teenager is very very fierce and doesn't want to be controlled and is terrified of you know terrified of being controlled because if I'm controlled then that means somebody could hurt me or abuse me again or take advantage of me Um, and so that's shown up a lot in my marriage 
and I've had to really see my husband for who he is and not for these, you know, past figures. Mm -hmm. But it's also just taken a lot of honesty between us, you know, like those moments where he does hurt me, you know, he does say something that hurts my feelings or, you know, he is insensitive to me and I can sit down and actually share with him, you know, what my history is like and why that hurts um, and for him to really, you know, be more mindful um, and vice versa, you know, me understanding when he doesn't, he doesn't like to be controlled either. We both have a similar wound <laughs> there. And so for both of us to really see that and, and to recognize when one of us is getting a little bit defensive or prickly with each other, what that's really about instead of taking it personally, which isn't always easy, but mm -hmm. we've shared enough with each other at this point that we really get each other. You know, when I can see when his inner teenager is out and he's feeling like not smart or not seen or not loved. Mm -hmm. um, and he can see, you know, for me when I'm feeling afraid and, and it's really just this process of softening to ourselves because I think the thing with the inner teenager that's interesting is the inner teen teenager is very demanding. Like they have all of these demands and these, you know, these desires, but they don't actually know how to get those needs met and they're not willing to be vulnerable. Whereas the inner adult is very much aware and willing to communicate. Mm -hmm. And I see that too culturally. It's this, you know, I'm right, you're wrong, or I'm going to rebel, but I'm not willing to have a dialogue. Right. And that's the difference between this, you know, immature way of being and this mature way of being where we can come together and disagree and yet still sit in the same space mm -hmm. and be curious about each other. So it's this process of growing up, which we have to do on our own and in relationship if we want to have healthy relationships we have to grow up together mm. yeah yeah it's like the collective like burn it down vibe yeah you know that people have where it's like this isn't working we need to burn it all down mm -hmm. you know it's kind of like that anarchist vibe that everyone has and um I think it's going to be really beautiful when people start to really work with their inner teen and respect that inner teen and really integrate that inner teen in a way that feels healthy and sustainable because I, my inner teen, I was such a baller. Mm -hmm. I literally love her. She was psychotic and a baller. <laughs> mm -hmm. But just mm -hmm. so much wisdom and power there. That was really yeah. like the beginning of a lot of our awakenings yeah. and a lot of the stifling of our power as a feminine too. Yeah, totally. And I'm glad you're sharing just these moments and growth periods with Ben because mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of people, I mean, you touched on this, but a lot of people go into relationship feeling like they need to be fully healed before being in relationship. And I had that belief at one point. Yeah. And I, I do a group experience called the sacredness of being single because I was single for so long. Mm -hmm. And like towards the second half of that period, I really understood the, just the true beauty in like that process. And I got started to get excited to be in these different transitional processes with another person whereas before I was scared because yeah. I'm like I gotta be perfect totally I gotta present mm -hmm. yeah you know um and so yeah I I yeah I just wanted to say that because I think it's really important to to share um mm -hmm. do you and Ben you know we we've mentioned ceremony a few times do you have particular ceremonies or rituals that you partake in together whether it's formal or just daily rituals mm -hmm. that help to, yeah, just kind of fortify what you're building together. Mm -hmm. Just a little bit of a mix of both. We're actually very different. Like we're very, very different cool. people. He's like insanely high energy. He, yeah. he, and I love it because I'm not. So he takes care of so much in our lives. Like he, he just takes care of stuff. So and like an Aries. I love that. He's not, he's a Gemini. Gemini. Um, okay. He's got that cool. cancer moon though going on. He, he's just a beautiful, beautiful human. And mm. yeah, I just, I love everything about him, mm. but he just has this way of going after every single experience and he has so much energy for, for the day. And I'm the kind of person where if I have one thing to do that day, like until I get that thing done, I'm thinking about that thing. And then once it's done, I'm like done, you know, and it's like, that's not how I operate. So I get exhausted just watching him, but I'm also just really still learning how to just let him provide in the way that he provides. And so he's Mr. Intensity. <laughs> like he's every day doing breath work. He works out almost every single day. Um, 
you know, the, some of the medicine ceremonies that he has engaged in are like really, really intense. Like he, he once did a Yopo ceremony, which mm. won't even like go into what that is. But if you look into it, it's like the most intense thing you could ever do. Um, and so there's a lot of things that he does that are very solar that he just does on his own. And I'm not really like, I'm not going to do Wim Hof with you. <laughs> I'm not going to, you know, sit in a freezer with you. Um, you know, I'm like more on the, like, keep the womb warm and like TCM pass. Yes. So there's a lot of things that he does on his own that I just appreciate. And then there's things that we do together. Like we have been, you know, practicing Tantra since the beginning. So we do a lot of ritual where we sit across from each other and we eye gaze or we do a clearing or we do these rituals where we just share what we appreciate about each other um and so we have a lot of those little things or we'll, we'll do like cyclical breath where we sink our breath together and we eye gaze before making love mm. um and we've we've been sitting in ayahuasca together for almost six years and he's really gone all the way down that path and i've sort of started to step away from the more again from the intensity um, so he has started to do, you know, dietas and really mm-hmm. go into it. And the more I had gone into it, the more sensitive I've become. And the more I realized, like, I'm really just going to work with subtle energies here. So like my work is actually just being in the forest, you know, that's, that's really all I need. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's been cool for us to appreciate each other and not try to change each other and not try to force each other into things that aren't right for us um i'm very much like a yin person Mm -hmm. so in the full and new moons i go down and i i work with the elements or you know on our land i'll make these flower mandalas or i'll gather you know and forage things from from our land and i will make these offerings and he'll come with me and we'll say prayers um for our anniversary we went down and uh went down to the river and we went through all of our vows again and we sort of assessed if there were any vows that needed to be changed or added Um, and then we said them again to each other and we made an offering to the earth and then we said a prayer Mm -hmm. and then we you know we released Um, so it's just like little rituals that we like to do together to stay connected Um, and also we a lot of times we're just doing our own spirit work um, and and honoring that in each other Mm -hmm. yeah it's beautiful I think it's almost sometimes with the masculine just doing that but not not being like we're going to do a rich you know it's mm-hmm. almost changing the language I think at mm-hmm. times to not make it seem so like you're taking an identity from them as the masculine to mm-hmm. bring them into things like this because mm-hmm. I feel like the idea I guess in western culture sometimes is that it's demasculinizing if you're mm-hmm. kind of doing these more feminine practices that are perceived as feminine but I think any time that you know I brought this sort of thing if we're doing it in a way that feels integrated and natural it doesn't feel like I'm trying to change him Mm -hmm. or doesn't feel like I'm trying to shame him for not doing anything if like the heart is in the right place and the intention is to connect from the heart it's been really beautiful so um I love that I think that's Mm -hmm. incredible yeah well and everybody has their own way of connecting you know and like there's a lot of I get a lot of questions from women who are like well what if my partner doesn't want to do the work and I'm like well you got to ask yourself like do they really need to do the work? Because n- not all the time, it's not often them, right? Like a lot of times yes. we're focused externally on trying to like make them do what we do and make them be more like us when really if we were just to do what we wanted to do and fully, you know, occupy that space of, you know, communing with spirit mm-hmm. and being holy in our bodies and celebrating in ritual, like we would feel that energy that we're wanting to feel. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we don't have to do everything with our partners, and I think that's where we've kind of gotten mixed up, especially as you say in Western culture, because like it's not, you know, there's you know, men are shamans and space holders, and 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 they're very connected to spirit. Mm-hmm. You know, the the men that have guided me in the spirit space have been incredible anchors. Um, so it's sort of this weird Western myth, this mm-hmm. this strange you know story that we've put on men. Mm-hmm about like how they should be and i think Mm -hmm. there are a lot of men who are breaking out of that now yes there's like so many men's groups that i see popping up all over so many amazing groups of guys who are getting together and going into prayer and dancing and singing and playing music and being in their lover being in their warrior and i just love that Mm -hmm. i think it's my favorite thing to see yeah yeah it's super powerful and 
yeah, I love the the honoring of the others kind of daily energy that they, you know, whether mm -hmm. he's a doer, doer, high energy, I just love the, and then also holding your own preference, which is kind of more slow and, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Nuance, you know, in yeah. that way, like, I just think it's, it's really powerful because I think sometimes we get a little bit insecure or yeah. speaking from my experience, like yeah. you get insecure about how you are and you're mm -hmm. like, I should be more like that. Yeah. And so it's just a settling in. That's really, mm -hmm. really beautiful. What is it about? women that want that do this and then want their partner to automatically do that like is there a type of wounding or a type of experience that's led us to always be focused on you know okay i'm starting to do this work my partner needs to do it too mm -hmm. like what is do you know what that is mm -hmm. i i think almost all humans have this which yeah. is like we're we're conditioned for sameness right yes. like we we want we want to be understood mm -hmm. and we want to feel safe and how am I going to feel seen, understood, and safe? Well, if you're just like me, then everything's going to be good. Yes. So difference is scary and threatening. I mean, look at politics. Yes. Right? Yes. Look at how like it's clearly just about sameness. We're just yes. like fighting. We're all just want to be seen and understood and feel safe. So in relationship, you know, this is happening all the time. And it's not to say that, you know, we shouldn't have a partner who wants to do the work with us. I'm just saying sometimes, sometimes some of the work you can do on your own. Yes. You know, there's and there's a lot of things that you are going to do differently you know and that's okay mm -hmm. like your, your partner doesn't have to do everything that you do in order to have a healthy relationship we're attracted to each other because we're different we're attracted to each other because there's these opposites that draw us together and so yeah for me it's really been recognizing when I just want my partner to like come with me so that I can feel safe or understood and then just go and do that and hold that space for myself and also really engaging in deep friendship mm -hmm. like friendship is so nourishing to romantic relationships and if we don't have friends then our relationship isn't going to be as strong mm -hmm. like we and you know you guys are perfect examples of this you know you're you're close friends and mm -hmm. I think a lot of people in our culture don't have that set up anymore like they have these little bubbles that they live in with their 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 spouse and their maybe their kids and they're they're not happy and they don't know why and it's like well do you know your neighbor's name mm -hmm. do you have any friends that you can call instead of your partner mm -hmm. yeah right we need that yes. and and that's been really uplifting for me in my life and one of the things that i encourage and teach a lot of my programs in my book it, it's always about it's about relationship not mm -hmm. just romantic partnership mm -hmm. like call in those friendships those people who can be with you through it all and who mm. who do want to engage in those things with you um so that what you share with your partner can be its own thing mm -hmm. yes yeah and i just on that like i find that for my experience and what i've observed with women in the group is like having not been in relationship for a certain period of time and then entering into relationship it becomes this like grasping and just clenching so mm -hmm. it's like i need to put all of my focus here because yeah. it has to work yeah and so then the friendships suffer yeah and i also saw that growing up like just with my parents and um it's been really good for because my partner is a social butterfly has so many really deep amazing friendships yeah. and he kind of had to tell me like it's okay if you you know want to also like have time with your friend you mm -hmm. know because I was like well no, 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 no. like because yeah. I was alone for a long time just out yeah. of relationship so I was it was a settling in mm -hmm. that you know I kind of reckoned with that yeah and I think a lot of the skills with conscious relationships work with friendships as well for sure they do you know going first being vulnerable being truthful like holding space just a lot they and that's what I, I didn't realize as well it's almost like I approach them as two different things this yeah. is how I were interact with my partner this is how I interact with my friends mm -hmm. and as I've sort of melded them both in the way that I'm going to interact with them I've become more of myself mm -hmm. I've become more healed it's become easier because it's almost like I think with my female relationships I was just only going so far yeah and then I realized actually I was only doing that in both. Mm -hmm. And then I was kind of dancing. Some places I'd be, de you know. So I think when people start to approach their relationships like they approach their 
romantic ones, you can have just as much healing, just as much growth, and they can be just as powerful, mm -hmm. which has been really, really beautiful. Um, but I'm excited about the book. Mm -hmm. I'm really excited. Becoming it's the one. Beautiful. Rainbows are on the back. Which I is know. My oh, I love it. So beautiful. Um, can you tell us about the the process of writing it? Whew, it was deep initiation for me yes i mean writing since i could pick up a pen like i've always been writing mm -hmm. when i was in, in elementary school i had a grade three teacher be like you are going to be a famous author one day like it was the only thing that i i really knew and and thrived in like remember when i was 12 years old i i had started writing poetry and at this time i was in a really rough spot in my life like i was really i was not going to school at all i was mostly staying up all night getting high and then writing poetry and then sometimes going to school and I wrote this poem called born as a rose and it was this very symbolic poem and I submitted it to my teacher and I, what I didn't know is that he actually had sent it off to a national poet society and they had chosen it like they I had won and so he told me after and it was just very early on where I felt this deep connection to writing so I always wanted to write a book I always wanted to be an author and so when I got this book deal I didn't realize that I was going to feel so confronted. Mm. Like I didn't feel excited. I felt scared. And I was really in this deep state of flail mm. <laughs> for about six months yeah. before I even really started writing. And what I realized is that the more that something means to us, right, is when the stakes are the highest, the more we're going to be confronted which is why in relationship we hold back so much. We hold back our truth or our vulnerability because we're afraid to lose it, right? Or we cling, like you said. And so I was sort of doing that with this book process because being an author meant so much to me. I didn't even know until I was there. And so I remember uh, Ben and I, we got to Hawaii and I had hardly written anything. I had written like a chapter or two and I was just really struggling and I sat down on the couch and I looked at him and before I could even say anything, I just started crying. Mm -hmm. And he sat down next to me and I was like, I'm not a writer. Like, I just want to quit everything. I just want to shut it all down. I want to give my advance back and I want to quit. And normally he's like, he'll call me out or he'll, you know, he'll try to pull me out of it. And he did not. He was just like, okay, well, if that's what you need to do, like we can do that. Like if that's really what you need to do, you know, you can quit. And he just sat with me. And that's when I realized like, oh, he really gets that I'm, I'm, you know, just needing to feel this right now. And that afternoon he held space for me to do a breathwork session. Um, and we do like a, you lay down and you breathe for like 40 minutes and move a lot of energy. And after that session, I started writing and I wrote the book in four months, the first draft. Of course we went through many, many drafts, um, but it just sort of opened up. And it, what I had to do was be on that threshold Mm. of like the depths of fear and just ready to give it all up mm. just ready to walk away and then I could claim it and I just didn't know that that was in there until I was at the door mm, wow. um, so this book is really special to me because it's my first book um, there's a lot of stories about my childhood and about my relationship you know with my mom um, a lot of funny stories about you know my relationship with Ben and also a lot of the teachings that you know I live by and that I've culminated through my work and through my writing so mm -hmm. it's been a journey did you write it in Hawaii yeah you did yeah and that's what's interesting is my Venus line runs right through Maui yes. and I was right in the, the west side of Maui and there was just this urge like I said to Ben I don't know why but I just need to be there to write. Yes. I didn't know that my Venus line was in Maui really and then I looked it up when I got there and and it just all flowed and then the interesting thing is my my editor her name is Eva her and I ended up becoming really dear friends and uh we kind of ended up late at the end with the you know book timelines are crazy and it's just a whirlwind you can't do anything else while you're writing a book mm. I didn't know that and we had to delay and so it ended up being that when she had a trip to Hawaii she had to finish my the last chapter so this whole book was written edited and completed with the energy of Hawaii wow. and that was just so special Powerful. to me because that that place really um it really held a special place in my heart yeah that, like Lumerian mm -hmm. vibe mm -hmm. wow that's mm -hmm. so crazy Powerful. Mm -hmm. yeah it seems incredible um, what are you, besides the book, mm -hmm. what are you most excited about right now? I think, 
I'm really most excited about growing food, cool. <laughs> building community. That's what I like to hear. Tell us more. Yeah, w- uh, my husband and I are team stewards of ten acres uh, um, of land, um, and you know we have a really beautiful community um, where we live in BC, and we're we're on the on the Gulf Islands, and. Yeah, we just really want to create a space where we can host a ceremony and grow food and just learn how mm-hmm. to, you know, stead, care, care more for ourselves and, and the, the earth um, and take less, you know, consume less. So we've really just been working on that. And so I've, other than, you know, the time that we've spent away recently, uh, I just didn't spend most of my days in the forest going for long walks and that's really where I get most of my insights and my learnings anyways uh, so really for me my, my main priority is just family and nature mm. you know those are the things yeah beautiful, beautiful. this was so mm-hmm. amazing I'm so, so glad we here. got to meet in person it was such a pleasure truly yeah. like thank you I just feel really grateful I feel really lucky the book becoming the one mm-hmm. is on our you can and it's out officially that. April twelfth. Yes, perfect. Beautiful. That's, the, that's mm-hmm. the advanced readers copy that you have there. I got the secret copy. The hard copy will be out on April twelfth. Oh, awesome! Yay. Beautiful. <laughs> Amazing. Well, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. It's yes. such a pleasure. Um, All right, bye guys. Thank you so much, Shalina. Make sure you follow Shalina Ayana on Instagram or her other amazing account at rising woman her book becoming the one is out today please order it right now yeah it's incredible i'm really really grateful that she wrote it i'm going to be digging in now i want to thank our sponsors our amazing brands that we work with through the podcast house of wise my favorite cbd sakara my favorite meal delivery athletic green something i have every single day issue something we use for the brand pendulum and Joybird. Supporting these brands helps support the show. So we really, really appreciate it. We have vetted them for you and all discount information is in our show notes and on almost30.com. We will see you on the next episode. Be well. Be well. Be well, babies. We love you. (laughs) Goodbye. Goodbye.